Barbarian is the latest film to scare the bejesus out of everyone who sees it, and many people are calling it the best horror film of the year. I, however, can't help but be disappointed by it because it could have been great, it's just not. How, you may ask? Well, I'm going to answer that using my patented Ease Review System. However, I need to warn you that the best way to see Barbarian is knowing nothing about it. So if you haven't seen it, go watch it, and then come back. There will be spoilers in this review. I'm going to try to keep it to minor spoilers, but no promises. And make sure to hit the subscribe button, or else Bill Skarsgård will turn into Pennywise the Clown, and then you'll float too. With that out of the way, let's talk about the movie, beginning with the setup. Barbarian focuses on Tess, a woman who comes to Detroit for a job interview and needs to stay in an Airbnb for the night. Her rental is already occupied by Keith, and since there seems to be no other option, Tess agrees to stay in the rental with Keith overnight. A fairly obvious horror movie setup, right? Wrong. Because Tess finds an underground lair filled with all kinds of dark, creepy tunnels, and then Keith goes missing in one of those dark, creepy tunnels. What's the matter, Pennywise? Can't see in the dark? Story-wise, there's a lot more to this film, but I'm gonna leave that for a little bit later. First, we need to talk about the effort put into this film, and I don't think anyone put as much effort into this film as the performers. Georgina Campbell as Tess, Bill Skarsgård as Keith, and Justin Long as AJ were inspired pieces of casting. Everyone understood their role, and they performed it to a T. I'm also going to give a shout out to the people who are in charge of the production design of this film. You may not be able to tell this from the trailers, but the film actually takes place in a couple of different time periods, and there are a few different sections to the main house that we stay in. And each of these places, depending on time period, have their own specific look and feel to them. And by doing that, you always have a very good idea of where you are and how you should be feeling inside that moment. It's an important thing, and it's not easy to pull off, and I'm glad that the production designer and the art direction crew were all there and putting in their best effort on it. And here's your first minor spoiler, I also need to give a shout out to the people who designed the creature in this film. Yes, there is a creature in this film. The creature is hulking, intimidating, and powerful, and when we do see it in those rare occasions, it's often in those creepy dark tunnels that I mentioned before, and it occupies that space in such a forceful way that you can't help but be scared of it because you know there is no way for you to get around it. This is a great example of creature design working in concert with its surroundings to make it all the more terrifying. I also love with this creature how we most often hear it instead of see it. <laughs> and so the sound designers need to be given their due as well. Top marks for effort all around. And now we get to talk about Audacity, one of my favorite sections. And yeah, Barbarian, it's got some audacity going for it. I would dare say it is an audacious film. And a lot of that has to do with the story structure and how that story structure is used in concert with dramatic irony. For those of you who have seen the first trailer for Barbarian, you know that at least one section of this film has to do with Tess and Keith. And that is in fact the first section of the film. You also get a hint in the trailer that something terrible happens during that that section and you would be right. But then after that event, we move on to a second section and that section focuses on AJ, who is played by Justin Long. And we go all the way across the country. We went from Detroit and now we're in California and it feels like you're watching a brand new movie all of a sudden. Except as that section continues, it all leads back to that original house. And so as AJ starts to explore that house, we already know more about the situation than he does. We know about the dark, creepy tunnels. We know why there are bags of clothes all over the place. We know why it looks like it was lived in because it was and we know those people haven't left yet and then there are even more sections and more characters added on after that and in each moment the dramatic irony where we know what's going on but the characters don't adds extra layers to what we are viewing it's all pretty fascinating to see happen in real time i will also say that the approach that the film takes to its main theme is audacious when taken in context with other horror films the main theme and i don't think i'm giving away too much by saying this is the generational trauma that is caused by sexual abuse and there are films that have covered this ground, although not in the same way. If you think about films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Hills Have Eyes, there is a fair amount of sexual abuse in those films, but it's not really presented as such. However, Barbarian takes a different approach, and I don't want to say much more than that because I think that would be giving a little bit too much away, but I think the smart people out there would be able to put two and two together on that. Now let's move on to stimulation, or what did this film make me feel? And in short, a lot of things. My stimulation in this film was very much rooted in the dramatic irony that I talked about in the previous section. As I began to know more about what was going on in the film, I started to react differently when certain characters would end up in certain situations. The film was absolutely using this dramatic irony to manipulate my emotions.
emotions and I loved it. For example, in the first section with Tess and Keith, there is a fair bit of tension involved. And that mostly has to do with the fact that we, like Tess, don't know a thing about what is going on. I especially like how they cast Bill Sarsgaard in the role of Keith because he has that extra horror baggage of being Pennywise the Clown. So most people just look at him and see a creepy guy who is probably the bad dude. And once again, the filmmakers are able to use that tension to manipulate me, and they did it really well. Then when we move on to the next section with Justin Long, we know more about the space, we know more about the house and what is inside of it. And so our reactions to what Justin Long does in that house are different compared to when Tess did them. It also allows for a bit more humor, a bit more laughter, but it's the kind of laughter that escapes your mouth when you are terrified. That emotional manipulation continues until the very end of the film, and I have to applaud the filmmakers for that. I never once said to myself, oh, this is kind of boring and not cool, except for maybe one thing that I'm gonna talk about in just a second. And that second has passed because now we're going to talk about the execution of Barbarian. How well did the filmmakers pull off everything that they tried to do? And I'll just say flatly and up front that the first section of the film with Tess and Keith and the second section of the film with AJ were pulled off near perfectly. I can find no fault with them. I love them to death. I think they are great examples of horror filmmaking. The common thread between those two sections were the creature and the house, in that the house was the focal point, the geographic focal point of those sections, and the creature was mostly unseen. We could hear it, we saw it occasionally, but it was mostly unseen. And as the film progresses beyond those two sections, we start to drift further and further away from those ideas. The third section recontextualizes how we feel about the monster. Instead of being terrified of it, I was terrified of it, and I also felt pity for it. I felt sorry for it, it was a strange combination of emotions to be feeling in the exact same moment. Conceptually, I really love the idea of framing the monster as being both the victim and the villain in this film, but when we start moving into the finale of the film and we leave the confines of the house, everything starts to become a little bit jumbled and a little bit muddled, and it feels like we're watching a completely different film than what we were before. And that is my biggest gripe with Barbarian. The finale doesn't feel like it is properly paying off everything that was set up in the first bits of the film. The house, for example, is so inextricably tied to how these characters came together and how they all come to be a part of the generational trauma that was inflicted by the original sexual abuse. The house is the key to this film, but then when the finale rolls around, the house is ignored. We leave it. We are no longer there. That, to me, is a mistake. And then when you combine that with this new contextualization of the monster as being something that is both the victim and the villain, and it just feels like the movie is tripping over itself to try to get you to a shocking and satisfying finale when it had a better finale at its fingertips the entire time. This is a great example of a film overreaching and being poor for it. And that's why I think Barbarian is really really good, but not great. It just didn't stick the landing. Speaking of films that didn't exactly stick the landing, why don't you go check out my review of Halloween Ends, which is right there. You can click on it right there. Go do that right now.